begin then with a, with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the great blessings that you give to us of body and soul, especially as we've seen here in Genesis chapter 15. You gave to Abraham that great gift of faith and trust and hope in you. And we pray, O oh Lord, that that gift uh, would be given to us as well, uh, that you would continue to nourish, strengthen, and increase our faith, hope, and trust in you. For as the hymn writer says, our faith looks up to thee. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we would always keep our eyes fixed on the cross of Christ and Jesus, our Savior, uh, that you would allow us to, to walk not by sight, but by trust and hope in you. Bless our study this day as we give you thanks for that great gift, and we pray that you would also then be with uh, Chuck Wagers as he goes in for surgery here this day. Uh, may you uh, be with him, that you would increase his faith, hope, and trust in you, and that uh, he and Donna would grow in their love for one another, for we place them into your hands, saying, Thy will be done, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, let's look here at Genesis 15. We left off here at verse 6. One of the great verses, not only in the book of Genesis, but in the entire Bible. And, uh, and then we were you know, looking at other places too, where the book of Hebrews and the Faith Hall of Fame talks about Abram's great faith. But we look here at verse 6, Genesis 15, verse 6. He... That Abram believed the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him as righteousness. Now, before we move on here, we have to tackle a big question. One that I think is very, very, very important. Because we, we throw this word around all the time. Faith. During George Bush's presidency, we had the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives which was uh, actually even run by an LCMS uh, person, Tim Gagline, from over in Fort Wayne, uh, who now is, uh, I think he's with, he's like Vice President of Focus on the Family. He's out in Colorado. But it was kind of like people of faith. People of faith. But what the heck is that? You know, it's the Office of, office of Faith-Based Initiatives. And we need to turn to our faith right now. We need to talk to people of faith. But when we, when we throw this word around, we begin to hopefully ask the question, faith in, in what? Or faith in who? What? I mean, just because just you have faith, that I had faith the Cubs were going to make the playoffs this year. <laughs> Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Next year. The uh, Tigers ended up making the playoffs. And I was at the Cubs Tigers game with Nathaniel here, what, about six weeks ago? And the Cubs bombed him and they looked horrible. But right after that, the Tigers just kicked it into high gear and it was kind of an amazing thing to watch happen. I mean, nobody two months ago said the Tigers were going to make the playoffs. But so you can have all the faith in, in whatever you want, but it's not so much your faith, it's who or what you believe in. It's the object of faith that's important. Not, not what you know your faith is or how much. And I think something here, here's kind of interesting, I think, in, in today's world. When people talk about faith, it's kind of faith in themselves. So, and well, let's just put maybe, let's just put this. Faith in self, faith in their works, or I think what we've almost had today is faith kind of faith. faith in my faith. Yeah. And so, the interesting person who's always, I think, really liking this faith talk is Satan. I think he loves faith talk. Oh, yeah. Because it gets you focused in on your self. On yourself. And Satan loves that. He loves when you get very introspective. Because if you're constantly looking in here, it means you're not looking to where? Up. Oh, yeah, God. you're not looking to Christ. You're not, you're not looking to Christ. And so you're always trying to figure out, well, how's my faith? Is it a strong faith? Is it a weak faith? How am I doing with my faith? Even if it's a smoldering wick, God will. That's right. Even, you know, Luther always used to say, even if you have a weak faith, a weak faith lays hold of a strong 
Christ. But Satan loves to get us uh, looking at our faith. And I want to I read something here from one of the, one of the commentaries here that I've been, that I've been using. And uh, it, it says this, kind of talking about faith. It says, Bible faith, though, does not keep staring at its own navel or poking at itself, worrying about what kind of shape your faith is in. Bible faith looks away from itself to the one who promises, and that faith finds its rest there. Faith, is, as Cindy said, is always looking, is, is, yeah, looking, looking to Christ. Uh, the Lord says, you know, look up to me. Even think of that hymn that I mentioned in the, in the prayer. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Faith isn't focused in on faith. Faith is looking at Christ. It's trusting in, in God, not in your faith. And, and that's where it ends up, kind of, we can have, instead of having Christ as the object of faith... We can end up having faith in me. Oh, I wonder how my faith is. i got to increase my faith. Well, that's true, but how do you increase your faith? By staying in the Word. By staying in the Word. Coming to church. Coming to church. Feeding it with Word. Feeding it with Word and sacrament. But we're not, we're not focused in on faith. That's why faith talk is kind of dangerous once in a while. We're not focused in on faith, we're focused in on Christ and trusting in Him, what He's done for me, what His words and His promises are. That's what got Abraham in trouble sometimes, is he wasn't remembering the promises of Christ, even when his circumstances and surroundings and his experiences were difficult. And so he needed to be working on that instead of sitting here, oh boy, as I look around, then I start looking at, oh boy, how are things doing here? Just remember, Christ has promised it. It is going to happen, even if it doesn't look like it is going to happen. So then now, with that being said, let's, let's move then on here now to uh, verse 7 and verse 8. And he said to him, who's the he there? That's God. So... Abraham believed the Lord. It was counted to him. We talked about that, that double imputation, that double counting. God counts our sins to Christ, and he counts Christ's righteousness to us. Then God says to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Where does faith look? It looks to Christ because, or to God, who's the one doing the work? God, not our faith. Faith... This, I think, is another thing that's very, very, very you important. You can't trust anything in yourself. Let's, let's put this up here as just a either or. Is faith active or is it passive? It's active. It's active. It's active. God's active in the faith. Okay. Yeah, God, God is the one who does the stuff. Faith just receives it. Faith doesn't do anything. But see, in our, not, our, in our normal world today, it's if I just have enough faith, I'll be able to move mountains. But it's not your faith. It's God doing it. Because God now says to Abram, look, I'm the one who chose you. You didn't choose me. You were a pagan worshiping pagan gods. You were living in a pagan land. You weren't saying, hey, Lord, look at me. I'm faithful. I got a lot of faith. Pick me, pick me, pick me for the team. You know, it's kind of like when you were a kid at recess and you all line up to play kickball. And, you know, you got two captains. Hey, pick me. I want to be on your team. It's not that Abraham's sitting there in Ur of the Chaldeans saying, Hey, pick me. I want to be on your team, God. God picks him. I'm the one who brought you out. Faith doesn't do anything. Faith just receives and trusts in that which God has already done and promises. And so God says, Hey, I'm the one who does it all. Look to me. I'm going to give you this land to possess. Then, verse 8, what does Abram say? O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Now, how are we to take Abram's response here in his question? Is it, is it, is it uh, doubt? Yes. I would say there's a little bit of doubt in there. You know, if you... If, if, how are you going to do it? Yeah, I, I think, now, how are you going to do it? 
you know, how, how, how are you going to do this? Uh, how am I to know? It's kind of like with celebrating LWML Sunday here. We're going to look at uh, Luke 8 and the angel Gabriel coming to Mary. You're going to give birth to a son. He's going to be the son of the Most High. And says, how is this going to happen, how this gonna happen how since I am a, a How am I a virgin? Yeah, how, how is this going to happen since I'm a virgin? Now, the interesting thing is, Mary isn't saying it's not going to happen. She just, She's just, know. well, the normal way of doing things here, <laughs> uh, how, how's this going to work? You know, I'm not married. How's this going to happen? Angel Gabriel says, you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The one to be born to you will be called the Son of the Most High God. So Mary's kind of seeking understanding. Now, did she have a little bit of maybe some sure. worries and concerns and anxieties here? Well, I would think so. She's pretty human. She's a, she's, 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 she is sinful, just like us. If she wasn't sinful, she wouldn't have died. Right. So there, you know, she, she well, died. Yeah, um, so church. it's so she's struggling a little bit, just like us. I think, you know, they Lord, I believe, yeah. help my unbelief, just like the Father. They're talking with Jesus. I think there's a little bit of that with with Abram here, but he's seeking some assurance. How is this going to be? There's probably a tinge of doubt in there. Is it total doubt and unbelief? No. But remember, there's always, even in the midst of our belief, there's always a tinge of unbelief because we're, we're sinners. But he's wanting some help here. Help me, help me understand this. Because if I go with my eyes, I, I can't see how this is going to happen. That's especially going to be the case here when we get to chapter 16. Not only is he struggling with how am I going to possess this land, but... How am I going to be a father when I don't have any? And a father of a great nation that's like all of the sand of the seashore when I don't have any children. Now, let's look at God's response here. Verse 9. This is, this is a very strange answer. He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, if I was looking for God... How is this going to be? How is this going to happen? And God says to me, we'll go to the zoo and pick up some animals. Or go down to Old McDonald's farm. And here's, you know, E-I-E-I-O. And here's what you're going to pick up. And they got to be three years old. Yeah. So all these things, you know, go down and get a, get a heifer, get a goat, get a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. It's a cross between Old McDonald and the 12 days of Christmas. You know, two turtle doves and a partridge and a pear tree. Go and pick everything up, bring them to me. And I'd be like, what? What on earth does this have to do with anything at all that we're talking about here? How am I going to possess the land? I'll go get a goat and a cow and a turtle dove and a partridge and a pear tree and bring them all to me. Now, the interesting thing is, is verse 10, Abram must know what's going on. I would have been, huh? Where am I going to find these things, and what on earth are we going to do with them? Now, we get to, we get to verse 10. But he, cuts he brought them all. So, Abram, oh, sure. Oh, that's a logical thing. Now, for us in our culture, we would be like, what on earth is God talking about here? Now, Abram knows exactly. Abram knows exactly what God is talking about. So, he goes, picks them all up, and, and he brought them. To God, all these things, and, and, and he cut them in half and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, that's kind of symbolic a little bit of, of what God's going to do here with these birds of prey coming down. It's God's going to take care of everything, but it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be problems in your life. And, and, you know, God never promises, what, what's the old Rose song? Garden. He never promises your, uh, oh, Rose, Rose Garden. Garden. Yeah. That's right. God never promises you a, a Rose Garden. Why do I need thorns? <laughs> but, but, yeah, even with the midst of a Rose Garden, you've got thorns. How does this, this um, fit into everything, really? That's my point, which we're going to get to. It's a great question, Jan. How, what on earth is this? That's my point. For us, we have no clue what's going on. Abraham knows exactly what's going on and, and what is happening here. 
And what's what's happening here? Let's let's put this on the board. And we're going to really talk about this here in a moment. Is this is how an Old Testament covenant contract agreement was put into place? And so Abram knows instead of you know going to the bank or getting a lawyer and and we're gonna we're gonna have this uh, loan and this contract or whatever it is the business agreement. And we're going to get the notary, and we're going to sign it, and this is what's going to happen. That's kind of the modern day version. This is how in the ancient world things were done. Between two countries, two kings, between two big gigantic businesses or people, you're going to cut. It's what's called a covenant. Cutting a covenant, which is cutting an animal in half. half. And you'd lay each side here, and there would be a pathway. So you'd put the animals here, cut in half. And then there would be a pathway going between. And you would walk through. After the deal, we'd have the handshake, we'd get the notary here in America, and we'd have the contract, and the lawyer would come, and the banker, and we'd sign it all and get it all taken get care of. Credit. In the ancient world, you'd get animals, all right, cut them in half, half here, half there, we walk through. We're saying to the other person, if I break this, may what happened to these animals happen to you. To me, wow. that you can kill me, you can take me out because I broke the covenant. covenant that we just cut. So that, so when God says go get the, the the goat and the heifer and all this, Abram doesn't even have to get the instructions. Okay, I know exactly what you're doing here, God. We're going to have an agreement. I'm wondering how is this going to happen? God's going to say it's going to happen. Here's the agreement between me and you. And as we're going to see here in a moment, something incredible is going to happen and that Abram's going to be asleep and he's not going to walk through. Who's going to walk through? God. By his lonesome God. That if this covenant is broken, I will be the one that takes the hit. Abram, not you. Which is an unbelievable thing. Because can God break the covenant? Yes. No. No. Not his no. 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 God can't break the covenant. We are the ones that. Know. And 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 God shouldn't be taking the punishment. The only person that can break the covenant is Abram, but he's not walking through, which means God is saying, Abram, if you break the covenant, you're not the one that's going to be cut in half. I'll take the hit for you, which is already a picture of who? Christ. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, who fits our gospel reading from last Sunday where Isaiah says that the Messiah will come and he'll be cut off from the land of the living. As Isaiah says, it will please the Lord to crush him, the Messiah, instead of us. We get this unbelievable picture right here in Genesis 15. God is saying, okay, here's the covenant. Here's my promise. If I don't keep my word... I'm going to die. I'll die for you. Now, the interesting thing is, is we know God's going to keep His Word. He can't sin. He can't break His covenant. He can't do evil. So what God is assuming is the only person who can break it is Abraham and his offspring. So if you do, the ultimate punishment will fall upon, will fall upon me. But He's trying to tell Abraham, Hey, look, buddy, you can, you can trust me. I'm willing to walk through here to say, you know what, if I break this, the punishment's on me. Which we know isn't going to happen because God isn't going to break His word, but He's trying to get Abraham to see, you can take this one, we'll put it in our modern day lingo, you can take this one to the bank. You know, this one, this this is going to happen. This, this is going to happen. Yes, Cindy? But in the Old Testament you see... Trying to get like, you know, God is like, you people, I, I want to end it, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, so I mean. And he does with regards to the land. There are going to be several different things because he'll say, this land, all right, is yours. But if you break the covenant, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, that's, yeah. that's yeah. very yeah. graphic terminology as you look at yeah. the prophets and, and what we get uh, later on with Moses and what God says. You guys do this, I'm going to spit you out. And, and, and I'm going to spit you out of the land. And he does, takes them off into captivity. But, does that mean that I'm no longer going to be your God and you lose salvation? No. no. Okay. The goal is, I'm trying to what? 
lead you ultimately to repentance. Uh, to show you that you guys are lost. Just because you're sitting here in this chunk of ground doesn't mean that you automatically inherit the eternal ground. Because for most of the Jews, they thought, well, I'm, we're God's chosen people, and I guess now we can do whatever the heck it is we want to do, and we're in. And God said, wait, 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 that, you, know, you, you didn't understand it. Abraham, just because he lived in the chunk of ground, doesn't mean that he's automatically in. What we just read, Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Not Abraham lived in the land, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was Abraham believed, he trusted, and that's counted as righteousness. And so, God is saying, okay, here's, here's the deal. I'm going to be your God now. I chose you. Because that's really the ultimate covenant. Going back to verse 7. I'm the Lord who brought you out from Ur the Chaldeans. I'm God. I've chosen you. I've saved you. Alright, now, trust in me. Go back to the first commandment of Luther's meaning. Fear, love, and trust in a me above all things. I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's going to take care of it. I, your, your offspring, though, is going to possess this land. And do they? Yeah, yeah. they do. They do, for a time. For a time, and then they break the covenant. And the interesting thing is, the uh, nation with regards to the land, the, the, the curse of breaking it does fall upon them, but not an eternal curse. The eternal curse for their sin is going to be taken on by who? Christ. Christ, and also for us. The sad thing is, is for most of the Jewish people, they don't have the blessing of the cross because they don't see Christ as the Messiah. They're too focused on the earthly promises. So are there essentially two parts to this covenant? There's, there's a lot of different covenants. Yeah. Yeah. But, but here's what we have is, the, is, this, is this land one and, and also just kind of everything that we have going on here. That I'm going to be your God. And that, that you can, you can, I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to forsake you, I am with you always. And that's, and that's what we, that's what we have here. Let's, let's kind of just for the sake of time, keep going here is, um, this covenant is, is what God does. And he's serious about this promise, and he's going to help you believe. And let's, let's kind of look at a couple of quick things here, um, with regards to finishing this up. Verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. It's kind of God's going to show up. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now that goes back to where we were here several months ago, when we've got Jacob and all the kids going down to Egypt, and eventually they become numerous and great, and they're enslaved, and that'll lead us to the start of the book of Exodus. But they're going to be out of the land for 400 years. Notice that God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give you this land, and everything is going to be that bed of, bed of roses. No, I'm going to tell you ahead of time that, you know what? You're going to possess the land. Now, the you there is very interesting, because Abram isn't going to possess anything except his cemetery plot. That's, that's the only land that Abram will ever own personally himself in the promised land, is the cemetery plot. That's it. Nothing else. But the interesting thing is the you there is kind of, no, it's okay, it's you there, it's the plural of his what? His, his offspring. They will possess the land, but just to let you know, it's going to be 400 years down the road. <laughs> That's, it's, it's going to take that long for the people of Israel to finally get it. It's, 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 it's kind of an amazing thing. God does everything in his own time. It, God does everything in his own time. It's not that, okay, once I have faith, that's part of the problem we had up here on the board. Today it's like if I just have enough faith, if you watch the TV preachers, then what? I can make it, I can make it happen. And it's going to happen now for me. And if it doesn't happen right now, it's because I didn't have enough Faith. It's the word of faith movement so stuff. Word that kind of Joel Osteen and all that. But the interesting thing is God tells Abraham, you know what, you're going to get it, but it's not going to be you, it's going to be your offspring. It's going to be your family is going to get it. But they're going to be afflicted, they're going to be slaves, and it's going to take 400 years before you get it. But then verse 14, I will bring judgment on the nation they serve, that's Egypt, and afterward they shall come out with great 
possessions. And they did. Kind of like Abram went down there. Remember? When there was a famine. It's kind of a preview of what was coming as we saw with Jacob, remember? And Joseph was already sent ahead, becomes the prime minister. There's going to be seven years, interprets Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's dreams, seven years of famine. You know, after seven years of plenty. So we got to store it all up. Then they come down and, and so forth and, and end up living there. But remember, Abram came in from Haram. Haran went in, there was the famine, then he goes down to Egypt, he says, oh, my wife's beautiful, so just say you're my sister, half-truth. All right, Pharaoh takes her into his harem, finds out she's really Abram's wife, and then it's like, why didn't you tell me? Here, why don't you split, but also take all this stuff. And get out of here. And it's the same thing that will happen when... His great, 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 great grandchildren leave, get out of here, take everything. And we'll see in the book of Exodus in our Sunday morning Bible studies, you know, coming up here in several months when they when they leave Egypt and get out, they, they leave with all these great treasured possessions, just as God told great, 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 great grandpa Abram's gonna happen. I'll bring judgment on that nation. That's the ten plagues. And afterward, they'll show, they're gonna come out with great possessions. As for you, verse 15, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's, it's, it's kind of an amazing thing to kind of um, think about here. Here's the promise, but it's going to be a long, hard time before that promise is fulfilled. Anyway, now. Kind of the big question is, how does this assure Abram? Remember, he's looking for assurance. How is this going to be? There's all these people here. I'm a small family. How is this going to happen? Now, does, does, does God hide the problems? No. 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 He, he doesn't cover up anything. He talks about, here's all the obstacles you're facing. Here's all the discouragements. And he places them right out there in the open. Now, as that is for Abram... Is it the same for you? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's totally different than the TV preachers. Well, once you come to faith and everything else, and it'll all happen now, and everything will be great. And if it's not happening now for you, it means you don't have enough faith. But is that is that is that biblical? No, because think of think of John 16, where Jesus says, "In this world, you will have troubles. Will not might not possibly not maybe, but you will. But take heart, I have overcome the world. But that overcoming doesn't happen for the most part." You're already a victor in Christ, as Paul says. Thanks be to God who's given us the victory right now, present, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have the victory, but it's not fully yours yet. Because you're going to struggle, you're going to have disappointments, you're going to suffer, ultimately, you're going to die. But, in heaven, there's the victory. It's the same, really, with, with Father Abram. And so God handles us the same way as he's always handled people, even the same with Father Abraham. You're going to possess this, but it's, it's down the road. It's, it's, it's down the road. And, and that's the same way it is here with us. Ron, you had a question? Yeah, it's maybe a little bit off subject, but I, I was, I've always wondered, is there a theological reason why seemingly in the, in the Old Testament God dealt with people in a face face. little bit more direct sense than he does today, or maybe Christ. deals with us a little more directly than I think. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Ron's question, you know, it seems like God was talking with people, yeah. saw them face to face, yeah. everything else. And the writer to the Hebrews starts his book out, his letter out, with that. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his, by his son. So, Jesus is now the ultimate prophet, the ultimate apostle, the ultimate priest, like Melchizedek and king and everything else we talked about last week. So God came down and spoke to people face to face. Not always fully, because as scripture says, no one can see God and live. But, you know, God did speak with Moses face to face. He's going to come down and speak to Abram now undercover. You know, he's like undercover boss if you watch that TV show. We'll see that here in a couple weeks after fall break where God, right before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus is going to come down and have dinner with, with Abraham and talk with him face to face. 
with the Malach Yahweh, in Hebrew, the angel, angel of the Lord. So, you know, Abram talked with God. And he, so you're right. And here, he is talking to him. We had Jacob's ladder. Jacob wrestled with God, you know, that we had last, what, spring, when we were, when we were going through that here in Genesis. So it kind of seems like you say... I mean, I don't think you've wrestled with God lately or had dinner with him. You know, <laughs> Cheryl wasn't, you know, making her big souffle and invited. woke me up. That's it. God woke Marcy up, you know, yeah. But, but uh, what, what, what's going on here? The writer of the Hebrews said, now, okay, once, once Jesus shows up, he's the last definitive word. We don't need anything else anymore. Everything's answered for us in in Christ. He was everything that we were looking for, hoping for, waiting for. He's arrived. So if we want the answer, we look where? Not to revelations and visions and everything else, but we look to the we look to the word and we look to Christ. Now, does it mean it's going to answer every single question that we have? No. To our satisfaction? No. Just as even when God appeared and talked to people like Abram and Moses and Jacob, did he and Mary, yeah, from this Sunday that we'll have in the Gospel reading from Luke 1, was, was, was every single question answered? No. No. No, no it wasn't. He, we, we work on a need-to-know basis. Here's what you need to know. I'm going to tell you. It's all you need to know. It's kind of like being in the Army. And I'll take care of it. Just trust me. Just trust me. Here's your orders. Here's what you're supposed to do. We're working on a need-to-know basis. Here's what you need to know right now. That's all you need to know. And just trust me that I'm, I'm going to take care of it. I, I've got the rest of it. Just like the general saying, I got the plan. All right, but you're just one little cog in this thing right here. Here's what you need to know, and here's what you need to do. See this little 17-yard section of, of dirt? You guys are in charge of it. Don't move. No matter what. Until I tell you to move. That's all you need to know right now. You stay put, fight them off until I tell you to move. We're working on a need-to-know basis, that's all you need to know. And that's kind, of, that's kind of the way it is with us and God. Here's what, you need, here's what you need to know. That's all you need to know. But most importantly, know i got it covered. I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to forsake you, and I came to save you. And, and so as we, as we look at this thing, it's, it's very... Interesting. Now, especially as we get to verse 17 here, and then we can get into chapter 16. We get to verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Now, really, that's so that we can see somebody's walking through, but the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch, who is that? That's God. That's God. God walks between the pieces. Now, as I said, this was the way to cut a covenant, to sign an agreement. There's a contract here. And Abram's asleep. He's not doing anything. This agreement is a one-way, it's a one-way gig. I'm the one making it, and if it's broken, I'm the one that will face the consequences. Because it says there in verse 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Not that Abram and the Lord made a covenant together, or that Abram made a covenant with the Lord. No. It's that the Lord made a covenant with, with, with Abram, saying, to your offspring I give this land. From the river of Egypt, from the Nile, all the way to, the yep, to Iraq. To the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites, which would be around Jerusalem, and, and so forth. I'm the one that's going to give all of this to you. And it's all going to be sheer mercy and grace. Now, for the Jew, they think that that's the promise. And that that's why we've got to possess the land. Now, the interesting thing is... They're focused in on the earthly, and they think the land brings salvation. And so that's where it goes to kind of, I wanted to kind of postpone Cindy's question here and so forth. What's all going on here? It, it goes to the question is, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of this land? Is that the ultimate point of all of this? That I'm giving you this chunk of ground. 
If it was, I think God would have gave it to Abram right yeah. away. But he's, it's, it's not so much what was the purpose of this chunk of ground. It's just, it's just that's, that's the be-all and end-all in your salvation is having this nation, which is what the people of Israel are so worried about. We've got to protect our nation. Now, you protect a nation because you're a sovereign nation, not that salvation is found there. So I'm not knocking them today for protecting their nation, just as if somebody invaded us, we would protect our nation. But they're, they're thinking salvation comes from owning a chunk of ground. That's not the purpose. The purpose is, I'm going to give you this land, so that now we're not going to have, because when they come in with Joshua, after Moses dies, read it all. We talked about that in the sermon here, what, two months ago, when we read what, Joshua 24, when he has the reenactment there at Shechem of the covenant there, when, 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 they, when they went in and, and so forth, um, and goes back and talks about, you know, we, we, we've wiped all these people out, kicked them all out of here, beat them in war, and now we're renewing ourselves and, and, and so forth here. But it's not the chunk of ground that's salvation. It's that we're going to live there. All of these other people are going to be kicked out. out because we don't want them to what? Influence us. To influence us and our... It goes back to the faith of Abraham. The trust in the one true God alone and His promises. Because God knows that if we're sitting here interacting with everybody else, what's going to happen? They're going to influence us, and it's going to be destruction. But until the Messiah comes, we'll put the cradle here, the box. It's a very rude one. Maybe it looks like an old TV. But, but we'll, put, we'll put the baby in there, all right? Until Jesus comes, all right, and is placed in the manger, this is the point that we keep the family of God together. We keep the promises of God together. And more importantly, as we've talked, we keep the lineage going so that what? We get the ultimate seed. And so I'm giving you this land so that I am going to what? Protect you so this family stays alive. It's why we were talking about everything here with Jacob and Joseph and Judah and everything else that they can't die because if they die, then there's no what? Christ. There's no Christ. So I'm putting them in this chunk of ground to take care of them because it's not so much the land as it is, it goes back to Genesis 3 with the promise that from your seeds, from your offspring, will come the will come the Messiah, will come the Messiah, the Savior. Now, is this chunk of ground now important? No. No, no because the Savior has has come. Just like we, we're not going to rebuild a temple. Yeah, but they don't the sacrifice. That. The Jews? No, they don't, which is why they're lost. And I is, think that is that what they believe is the covenant with God? That they, 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 they would believe that this land is their eternal possession. Yeah. But it's not so much the chunk of ground when it's fulfilled in Christ. Then we have something that's bigger than what's over there in Jerusalem today. Now we're going to have the whole World. new heavens and the new earth, as it says in Revelation. Now we are going to possess not just one little chunk of this ground, but we're going to possess the whole shooting match. But isn't that because of all the the things that have, have um, that the Jews have dealt with in the past? That are all the persecution, yes, and the Holocaust, the and everything yes. else. Yeah. Yeah, that's why they want to stay on this land. Right, because they're because they're wanting that's to. Right. Well, they think it's theirs. That's and the sad the sad part was is that the UN and everybody in the Zionist yeah. movement after World War II felt bad, and we should have, yeah. for what happened with the Holocaust in Germany and everything. Right. So we came in and gave Israel back the land when it wasn't really theirs. The sad thing is, if you want to really talk about it, who did we kick out mostly? Because Christians. Who was mainly living in the Holy Land but Palestinian Christians? It wasn't Islamic ground either. There were Islamics, there were, you know, um, Muslims living there. But when you look at Bethlehem and so forth, it was almost all Palestinian Christians. And so it's, it's very sad that they were the ones that mainly are now, you know, persecuted and kicked out. Because Bethlehem was almost an entirely Christian city. 
Now it's under Palestinian control with the Muslims controlling it. When we've tried to have the two-state solution. But I don't, I don't want to get into the politics of the whole thing, no. but mainly from a theological standpoint, what you're seeing is people are always focused in on this earth. Because here's the Word of Faith movement with the Christians and Joel Osteen and his empire down in, down in Houston and all the TV preachers, and you got the Jews. Everybody is wanting the blessing right now. now. And, they're, and they're failing to realize that the blessing comes in Christ. And all these things were pointing to Jesus. And they're fulfilled, as the writer of the Hebrew says, in Jesus. And that's going to lead us now to the new promised land. Because the writer of the Hebrew says, when you look at Abram, Abraham believed God, and he wasn't so much looking for this chunk of ground as he was looking for, from what we see here, I'm never going to get to really live this. But and what is, there's a Savior coming from my offspring that's giving me the eternal heavenly home. Actually, where heaven will come down to earth, Revelation will have the new heavens and the new earth, and we will get this chunk of ground. But it's not just going to be little Israel. It's the whole, it's the whole world. Back again that was given to Adam. That was given to Adam. And now you, I give you dominion. You're king of this earth. Adam's great sin was is he, he didn't want to be king of the earth. He wanted to be king of the, of the universe. Of everything. But we're, he wanted to be God. He wanted to be God. God's holding out on him. And we're going to see that's going to play out here again with their great, 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 great grandchildren in just a moment in chapter 16 with Sarai and Hagar. Because the terminology is exactly the same as Genesis 3. It's the same exact Hebrew. Because remember, who were Abram and Sarah supposed to be? They're supposed to be the new Adam and Eve. And God's putting them in the new Garden of Eden. And we're going we're gonna to start all over. But we begin to see they can't be the Savior because they're going to fall just like they're not so great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. And, they're gonna, and it's going to be almost an exact replay of everything. So we've got to have a Savior that's going to come from this family, but he can't be like this family because no matter where we're at in the book of Genesis, this family always falls. Adam and Eve fell. Their firstborn son, Cain, fell. Noah was going to be now a new Adam. And we've got a floating garden of Eden with the plants and the animals and everything else. We're going to start all over. Noah gets off the boat. He gets drunk. And all of a sudden, that falls apart. Then his grandchildren, the Tower of Babel, fall apart. Now God says we've got to start all over again. Now who are we going to start with? We're going to start with Abram and Sarai. They're going to come. I'm going to put them in the promised land. We're going to start all over again with a new Garden of Eden. Everything is going to be great. Now that's going to fall apart. We're going to see here in 16. And it's going to be an exact replay. Just as we're going to read it here in a moment. Just as... Um, Eve took the fruit and gave it to her husband. So now, Sarai is going to take Hagar, it's the same Hebrew, and give it to Abram. And we're going to, God, God was supposed to give us this promise of, of kids, and, and he's holding out on us, just like Eve thought. God's holding out on us. He doesn't want us to have this, this, this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil that will make us wise. God's holding out on us right now. He gave us this promise, but He's not fulfilling it, so i got to take over and be God. And it's the, and it's the same exact thing. So this, this <laughs> Savior is going to come from their family, but at every turn, we see it just isn't working. So the only way it's going to work, which ironically leads to L.W. Mel Sunday, how this is all fitting together, is now God, because now we finally get Mary, who's a great, 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 granddaughter of all these people, is now we're going to take the same family, but we can't have an earthly father. Because if we have an earthly father, this kid is going to be a sinner, just like Pops, and great, great, great granddad, and grandma, and everybody else. So he's going to be born of a woman, a human being, but he's also going to be his man, but he's also God. And we're going to finally get this thing straightened out. Only man could do it, and is supposed to do it, but he can't do it, so God becomes man to do it, to do it for us. And that was the purpose of the family, and also the land, and the, and the promise. And that's the problem with the modern day Jew, is they don't 
realize the land doesn't provide salvation. It's the land and the family that will provide the salvation that's found in the Savior. For the world. Not for the world. Them. And not just and that's what, yeah, I was reading today Ephesians in my morning devotion. I was in Ephesians 3. And that's what that's what Paul says. It's that, yeah, this mystery, but it wasn't just for Abram's family. It's also for the Gentile. Mm -hmm. It's for the whole world. As Jesus says in John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave me his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He came to his own people, John 1 starts, he came to his own people, but his own people did not receive him. Because they were looking for this earthly warrior, this earthly king, who's going to restore the land back to him. But the land and the family's purpose was to give us the Christ. Is to give us the Christ. And that's what Paul is saying in Romans. Guys, don't you understand when he gets to Father Abram and everything else, that, that once we have the Savior, the land in the in the family isn't it, it's 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 not so important. Now, does it mean, as Paul says, that God has forgotten about his people? No, no absolutely not. The promise of salvation is still for them, just like it is for the Gentile. But God chose them to be, if you want to say special, not because they were special people. Because that's what Paul says. Look, Abraham wasn't special. He was a pagan. He wasn't like, oh, look at that virtuous chap down there. I'm going to choose him. No, 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 no. He was a loser. God said, hey, I'm going to give you the gift of faith. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to do all the work. And from you will come the Savior of the world. And, and, and that's, the, that's the point that, that Paul's trying to get across. It's all grace. And now, God, God still loves that family. But, but that family is still just like everybody else. God just used them to provide salvation, just as God sometimes uses some of us to do some amazing things sometimes. And, and, and it's the same, it, we can go to the Gospel reading with Mary. God chose Mary. It wasn't that Mary was some wonderful person. She was a probably a sixth grader. You know, she's a teenage peasant girl. And God chooses her. She's highly favored by God. God decides to put his mercy and grace in favor. Now, just like Abram, she does have incredible faith. But she has her doubts and her worries, just like Abram does. Because kind of throughout the Gospels, read it, Mary begins, even though she has all these promises and saw some unbelievable things, she and the rest of her children later on, Jesus, brothers, sisters, and Mary, come and they want to get him. The disciples say, hey, they've come to get you and they've got the straight jacket for you because they think you're off your rocker. I mean, yeah, you're special, but <laughs> this seems to have gone maybe a little too far. So, again, they believe, but yet they're not... They're unbelief still. Yeah, they're not sure, just like the disciples. You're God, but I'm not exactly sure what God's supposed to look like and be doing right now. And that's, that's, that's that struggle. We all think, gosh, if we would have been there, that you would have cleared everything up for me. Now, when you read the Gospel of Mark, the only people who know clearly what's exactly going on are Satan and the evil angels. <laughs> they say, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. The rest of our Lord's disciples, when Jesus keeps asking them, who are we, who am I, to them, they're struggling. But the, 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 the demons and Satan know right out of the gate, we know who you are. Everybody on the human side is really struggling until they get to the resurrection. And then what's amazing is, is Mark, when we studied the book of Mark, doesn't have the disciples there at Jesus' death saying, oh, now I know who you are. It's the Roman Gentile centurion who says, surely this man was the Son of God. I, the, the disciples and his family didn't get it the whole way. And then Mark shows us, now we finally get it. We go to the cross. And it's not, his, 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 his mom's there, and John's there at the foot of the cross. It's not them saying, I know who you are. It's now the Roman pagan who says, I know who you are. You're the, you're, the, you're the Son of God. It's kind of an amazing thing. Because, again, the point of it is, from beginning to end, it's not who we are, it's all God in His, in his gift of grace. Yes, Ron? Yeah, <clears throat> so generation after generation, 
It was just pretty much like Adam and Eve. Sin got in there. <laughs> yeah. Because but, but, they're born with it. But, Conceived. But God, when he created man and even angels, <laughs> he created with free will, right? And with like, Adam and Eve, and then they lost it, and now their will is bound in spiritual matters. You can yeah, decide what you want for lunch when, today, but you can't when, choose God. When we're gone, and we're in heaven, or this new heaven and new earth, sin won't be able to get in there. Right, right. Be because what, and that's why God makes death now, less is death, because it gets rid of sin. There'll be no Satan, right? right? Well, there'll, there'll be Satan, Satan yeah. but he'll be frying in hell. But he can't touch you. Right. Oh, okay. Because you separate. But that actually now happened, which is, now we're off topic, but it's okay. But that actually happened with the death and resurrection of Christ, where Satan was cast down. Because remember when we did the book of Job on Thursdays, Satan could waltz right into heaven before the cross. He could waltz right into heaven and accuse God's people and have these, which I don't totally get or understand. That's where we're back to the need to know basis. I don't get that, and I still struggle with that. I've tried to read things, and I probably will not get it. Till I get to heaven and I'll ask God, okay. but then I probably won't give a. We don't have. I won't give yeah, a care about it. It's like Pastor so, Rody said, he's it, like a dog on a chain. Yeah, but but <laughs> it's yeah. He can go so he far. can bark right now he can, <laughs> because he was chained up with the cross, resurrection, and ascension. Yeah. But before that, he could waltz around and walk right into heaven and say, "Hey, well, how, how can this guy be here? He was a bum, and and everything, and, and God's you know." And then we get to Job. God says, well, why don't you go work on Job for a little bit? I've always thought, gee whiz, thanks, God. You know, why, don't, why, don't you go, why don't you go work on Allmeyer a little bit? You know, if you want to, if, you if you're bored and you want something to do, go, go, go work on Allmeyer. Because it says, have you considered my servant Job? He seemed to be bored. You're trying to find somebody. You know, why don't you go work on him for a little bit? It's just, it's, to me, it's just, it's, it's, it's just mind-blowing. You know, to think of that. But the whole point that now Job's going to suffer immensely. Mm -hmm. But God knows that what? Job's Job going to make it. Him. And he's going to keep Job in the faith. You know, as we confess, not only does he create the faith, but he still preserves it. He keeps us in it. But there's all these things that we just... Doesn't man leap on his own understanding right, instead, instead, of, instead of knowing that he's right. got, it's, the knowledge comes from God and the right. wisdom? But right. all of us, we're always leaning on our own understanding, thinking of our own little human minds, Correct. and we just can't accept. Instead of what, you know, God does, you know, in and, and uh, through us. So, what what I want to do is one, one final thing here to wrap this up. Where's, where's all this pointing? Let's go to Galatians 3, and then we'll jump into 16 here today. Let's go to the New Testament, go to Galatians 3. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd, Corinthians, and then Galatians. So it's right after Corinthians, and then you get Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So let's go here to um, Galatians 3, and let's look at verses 13 and 14. Now, wh where's all this pointing? It's pointing ultimately to the cross. Here's the curse if you break this covenant, here's what's going to happen. So, where, where is this all coming you know, to a head? Paul reminds us in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by breaking this covenant, that we're going to wander away from God. We're now married to Him. That, that's, remember, the picture we had in Hosea when we did that. God has chosen His bride. Now that's even us, the church, as Paul says in Ephesians 5. So he's chosen us, but we love to, to use the terminology from the Old Testament and from Hosea, whore after other gods, always be the adulterous wife. That's why God has Hosea marry a prostitute. And it's that picture. So now, because we broke the covenant, and really it's the covenant of marriage, and that's why I tell you, Cindy, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. So with this covenant, it's this covenant of marriage. I chose you. I've betrothed myself to you. I've married you. Now be faithful to me. So, but if you're not faithful to me, the curse isn't just being chucked out of the land. And the interesting thing is even with Abram's family, they're chucked out of the land of Babylon, but what? God brings them back because the Savior hasn't been born yet. That's the purpose. And he's got to be born in Bethlehem and all this good stuff. But the ultimate thing is breaking the covenant of marriage. Fear, loving, and trusting in somebody other than 
than our husband, our groom, Christ. Who's going to take the hit for that? Should be us. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of breaking the covenant by what becoming curse the curse for us. For as it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. A tree. Wow. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of, here it is, he's going back to what we're reading, the blessing of Abraham might come to the, Gentiles. the Gentiles as well, so that we might receive the promised spirit through what? Faith. 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 <clears throat> Which is the whole point that Abraham is pointing to. So here's the interesting thing. And then we'll close this section. Are you a child of Abraham? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, if a Jew was in there, they'd say, no, you're not. You're Goyim. You're not one of the 12 tribes. But you are a Jew. Adopted. Not by genealogy.com and your DNA, but because it was always Abraham was not born a Jew. God chose him. Yeah. He was a pagan like Saddam Hussein. But God chose him, and now he becomes the father of the Jewish people come through him. But he was he was an Iraqi at the beginning, too. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. But what, what makes Abraham, Abraham is not his DNA, but faith. Faith. And now, as Paul says in his letter to the Romans, all who have faith are children of Abraham. children of Abraham, children of God. Because we're adopted in. Because we're all adopted in, just like Abraham ultimately. That's he Paul's was. point in Romans. He was adopted in. you got to go back. Where did the Jewish people start? Well, of course, they started with Father Abraham. Was Abraham born a Jew? No. 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 He was an Iraqi. He was a pagan. He was a Babylonian. And God made him something. And then God did that. Abraham saw that and he trusted in this God who was doing this for him. Because God ultimately gave him the gift of faith. Just as God gives you the gift of faith to show that even Abraham was adopted in. He, wasn't, he didn't come into this biologically. And now all we come in through faith. Because ultimately it's all gift. It's all grace. Just what? Do they look at it that way? No, no, they don't. But it's just like John the Baptist. They sit there, you know, the Jews, well, you know, we can, oh, we're, we're, we're children of Abraham and all this. And, and John, well, John says, well, if God wants to, he can make children of Abraham from these stones. That's true. Which he's trying to say, that's actually go back to Father Abraham. He just picked up a stone and made him the Father Abraham. It's because the Jews. For the Jews and for us, mm -hmm. because he's also our father, Abraham. He's also he our father, Abraham, too, Jew. because it's all those, as the letter to the Hebrew says, all those who have faith. And Abraham was saved not because of his great faith, but he was faith in the one who was promised. No. As Jesus says, there were a lot of people who wanted to see this. Abraham wanted to see me, but he never got a chance to... To see me. David wanted to see me. He never got a chance to see me. But now he tells the people that are the grandchildren of all these great people, you have seen me, but now you're all ticked off. And it was your grandparents who wanted to see me. They longed to see this day and they never saw it. The day has arrived, now you get to see it and you're mad at me? And I'm even one of you. So why are you ticked off at me? I've come to save you. Because the problem is, is they want what? What we all want. I want my land. I want my money. I want my fun. Earthly king. I want, my earth, I want the bread king from John 6. I want, I want my health care paid for, my college debt paid for. I want my house paid off. I want mortgage relief. I want my $25,000 house tax credit, I want all these, I want, what are you going to do to provide all these things for me? Jesus, well, that's not why you came, because you're still, you're still going to die. You're still going to die. I have come to provide eternal life. That's the whole point. And he's going to do that by taking the curse of the covenant on himself. If this thing is broken, somebody's got to die. God doesn't kill Abraham and his family, nor does he kill us. God kills Christ in our place. Alright.
kills his son. Now, let's jump into chapter 16. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis 16. And now, Abraham has this great faith. <laughs> All of a sudden now, things are going to fall apart. And let's read uh, Genesis 16, 1 through 7. Let's start there. Genesis 16, 1-7. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. So all of a sudden now, we've gone from, oh, this is wonderful, how am I going to know this is all going to happen, everything else, God has had this great covenant, but yet now, it's kind of like Moses putting this all together, now it takes us and just smacks us right between the eyes. We just hit a brick wall. Ooh, this is great. Abram's got faith. God says, if this doesn't happen, I'm going to die. I'm going to keep my promises. It's going to be wonderful. We think that when we start chapter 16, it should be the cigars are coming out and everything else. They're in the maternity ward. Here comes the child. This is wonderful. What's the name going to be? Is it a boy or a girl? I, I hope it's a son because that's what we need. And then we get, now Sarai, Abram's wife had borne him no children. What? What's, what's going on? Keep reading. Alright. So, um, she had a female Egyptian servant, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord, has, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, so now that tells us how long has gone by since they showed up in the land. Ten years has gone by since this promise was given to him. Still, no children. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Then let's keep reading. And he went into Hagar... And we're going to come back, but let's just get this whole section. And Hagar went, or he went into Hagar, she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I give my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. And the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. She's going back from where she came here in, in, in Egypt. Now, let's go back and let's start unpacking uh, this uh, whole thing here. And uh, what, what is exactly all going on here. It, it's kind of very, very, very interesting here what's all transpiring. Let's... Um, <laughs> Let's, um, let's, let's kind of start out, though, by going back here. Um, let's, let's go back to Genesis 3. Let's go back to Genesis 3 right now. And let's, let's go ahead and read that here right now. Let's go ahead and read that. And let's read Genesis 3, 1 to 7. Okay? So Genesis 3, 1 to 7. Now the serpent, that Satan, was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say that you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, what do you think the temptation is? Remember, this is this is no. Eve. This is Eve now dealing with Satan. What is the temptation now that that Sarai? She's the new Eve. What is the temptation that Sarai is facing? Doubt. Did, doubt. Did God really say that you're going to have a, a child? Ten years has gone by. You're not getting any younger, lady. You were old before. Now, woo, you're really old. I mean, you are old. Well past childbearing age. So did God actually really say that? So Satan is trying to get Sarai to doubt the promise. And so the woman said to the serpent, verse 2, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
So now, there's belief and there's unbelief. Well, this is what God did say. But yet now I'm adding and subtracting to God's word. Sarai's thinking, well, God said this, and it was supposed to be between me and Abram. But maybe it wasn't between me and Abram. Maybe it was... Maybe we got to help him out here. Maybe it's between me and somebody else. Some of the ancient customs are, if you don't have a, um, a child, you can give a servant girl, and that would become a proxy, kind of like Mormon wives or something, sister wives. So we'll just we'll give my husband another wife, and bam, maybe that'll be that'll be the solution to this. So we're, we're kind of almost looking at the same thing. Verse four, but the but the serpent said to the woman, Ah, that's not exactly true. You're not going to die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The temptation here, very quickly, is God's holding out on you. He's keeping this because he doesn't want you to be like him. So why don't you take charge? Because you know better. See the same temptation with Sarai from what we just read? Oh boy. You know better than God. Make it happen. So verse 6, So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband. Gave some to her husband. It's the same Hebrew that we just read in, in Genesis 16 that we'll look at. Gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open. They knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Okay, go back now to chapter 16. As you're turning there, remember, as we said earlier, Abram and Sarai are supposed to be the new Adam and Eve. Supposed to be the new Adam and Eve. Supposed to be the new head of humanity. But from what we just read in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, we see exactly almost the same story that we read here now in Genesis 16, 1 through 7. Because Abram now, just as Adam did what? Listen to the voice of, yeah, his wife. So Abram, it's the exact same thing. So for the Hebrew person reading this, Moses, who's putting this together, wants you to remember what happened in the Garden of Eden. This is the only time in the Hebrew Bible that, that some of these words are used. So number one, Adam listened to the voice of his wife, and so did Abram listen to the voice of his wife. It's the same exact thing. And then now, the other thing is, is that Sarai gave Hagar to her husband just at, it's the exact same it's Hebrew Eve. word, just as Eve gave the, the, fruit. the fruit to Adam. So, so we've got the same thing. Sarai gave Hagar. So, and then in Genesis 3 it was, the fruit, and here is Adam listening to the voice of his wife Eve. It's the exact same thing. So in a roundabout way, what Moses is wanting us to see here again is we've got another fall into sin. We've got another fall into sin. Thanks to those wives. <laughs> and it's yeah, very, very, very interesting. But, you know, the but, main point, I think, of what we're going to read here, and we'll get to the rest of it next week probably, in chapter 16 at the end, and then in the 17, is that what is what so far is Sarai's problem? It's taking what? Too long. Too long, plus we're past the time. I mean, all hope is gone. I mean, biologically, I can't have a child, have a child anymore, which is also a picture of the gospel reading we're going to have this Sunday. Biologically, can, can the Virgin Mary have a child? No, no, no. Not. It's impossible. But, as we read in Luke 1, what's impossible with man, God makes possible. That's the whole point with this. She shouldn't be able to have a child. Now, see, that's the whole point, too, that God wants the Jewish people to understand here, is that what we're seeing play out with, with the Virgin Mary 
is the same thing that played out with Father Abraham in Sarai. And it's a one and only son. How many children do they have? Just, just one. Just one. It's my one and only son. Which is going to be very interesting because this is God's one and only human son because, you know, as Scripture says, Mary had, Mary had other children with the Greek. Now, our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters will think those are cousins. But, but it would, when, when you look at it, you know, James being the brother of our Lord and other things, you even look at tradition outside of the Scriptures, it sure seems to be same mom, different dad, of course, because um, in Jude 2 would be... Because, you know, as it says in Mark, aren't his brothers and sisters here with us? Now, they want to translate that cousins, and we'll just kind of forget that. But, um, you know, we've got, we've, got a different, we've got a different dad, because Jesus is conceived by, as we confess in the Creed, and as we'll hear in, in Luke 1, conceived by the Holy Spirit. But it's one and only Son. One and only son, and it's a miraculous conception. Mm -hmm. Because, again, does not go with our human mm -hmm. effort. Now, Jesus can't have an earthly dad, because if he has an earthly dad, he has sin. So, And then he's dying for his own sin, he can't die for somebody else's sin. So there's theological concerns there. But the whole point is, is when it comes to salvation, it doesn't have to do with anything that we do. And here it's always supposed to be a picture leading to Jesus. And we'll get to that when we get to, what is it, Genesis 21, where God tells Abram to do what to Isaac? Sacrifice. To sacrifice. sacrifice. And they're going to go to the same exact spot where the temple sits today. Where now the, 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 the Dome of the Rock sits, where Abram was going to sacrifice Isaac. But the, incre the incredible thing is, is they're walking up the hill when we get there. It's going to be an amazing thing. And what does Isaac have on his back? The wood. The wood, yeah. The wood for yes, the burnt offering, yeah. all right, and he's, and he's got just as Jesus is carrying the cross up that same hill. Oh, geez. It's an incredible thing, and then Father Abraham is carrying what the fire mm -hmm. and the the knife. the knife, and so then he's getting ready to sacrifice. The voice comes down. It's Jesus. Now I know you believe in me. Don't worry. The Lord will provide. Because he's going to send me to do it 2,000 years down the road. And so now I know that you wouldn't spare your one and only son. Now, the letter to the Hebrews gives us an incredible picture that Father Abraham was willing to do this because he knew that if he sacrificed his son, the promise has to go through him now, which is incredible faith, and not through Ishmael, because as we're going to see in 16 here, he wants Ishmael to be the son now because he still loves him. But it says there, the writer of the Hebrews says, because... Abraham knew that if he did kill his son, that God would raise him from the, the, dead. the dead. Now, that's a great picture of Jesus because God will raise him from the dead. But it's this whole thing, and that's why after the resurrection, Jesus takes his disciples through this Bible study that we're doing, especially here in Genesis, and say, guys, don't you get it? This was all pointing to me. And then finally, like in Luke and so forth, they say, gosh, now I get it. But it took me until the end for those guys like Peter and James and John to finally put it all together. It wasn't about this, this kingdom here on earth and the chunk of ground and everything. It was all pointing to, to this guy I'm looking at who died on the cross and rose again. But as we see here in 16, Genesis 16, Sarai thinks that, that, that God has a case of the slows. And so they're going to now have to, to step in, and she's going to have to have the cure. So let's, let's kind of look at a few things that will set us up here for next week. Okay? Because this is, this is amazing stuff here. This chapter, and I think coming up in 21, are, is, is some amazing stuff. And sandwiched in between there, we got Sodom and Gomorrah, which is kind of interesting. It's Kind of like watching daytime soap opera television. But, so that's kind of, it's kind of interesting, but also within that story is this encounter with Jesus and Abraham, which is, I think, pretty amazing. So we've got kind of, I think, an amazing thing here, but 16 is truly amazing, and it leads us to 21 that's truly amazing. And then in between there, we've got Sodom and Gomorrah, which 
does have a lot, I think, to kind of say of where we're at here in our nation today. But mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's kind of look at a few things that will set us up here for next week. <laughs> Starting at verse 1, chapter 16, we'll go back and kind of work our way through these verses and answer some questions that help us get set up for next week. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. That's the smack between the eyes, as I've said. We're, we're still, and we, and we got from verse 3, we're 10 years into this and nothing. So, it's, here, here it's just kind of like, okay, what's, what's, what's the solution here? Let's go to verse 2. Sarai said to Abram, here's my solution. Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Who does she blame? God. She's blaming God. She, she blames God. In a roundabout way, with She's the fall into sin, Adam and Eve both blame God, mm -hmm. too, for the fall into sin. When God okay. comes down, if we would have kept reading in Genesis... And asks, you know, Adam, who's to blame? He says, well, the woman you gave me. Um, it's really your fault. It's going to find until he gave me this woman, and then we got into big trouble. But it's, <laughs> but it's really, it's not even, it's not even so much. He's kind of like Father Abraham. He throws his wife under the bus. But it's not so much the woman's fault. It's, 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 it's God's fault is who he plays the blame. It's the woman you put here. So, yeah, Eve's at fault, but if we really want to blame anybody... It's you, because you made her. I was doing fine. Wouldn't have had any problems with me and Spike and Rufus and, my, and the cat Fifi and everybody else. Yeah, there wasn't a real help me. And by the way, you really outdid yourself with this woman. It's amazing. But, kind of got into trouble here. So. But why did God, this is what I struggle with, why did God put up that temptation in the Garden of Eden? No, he did. Because, because you had the free will. Satan. Adam and Eve, yes. you got to remember, had free will. Mm -hmm. And so they, they had free will, and after the sin, they lost free will in spiritual matters. Right. But the whole point was, is God didn't create robots. There was only, there's the, just that one temptation, it was, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as Martin Luther says in his lectures in Genesis, that was the church. That was the church. That's where they would go every Sabbath, every Saturday. They would, they would go there, and if God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there to say, I give you everything. Everything here is yours. But this one thing I reserve for myself. You have everything. And the Bible says it's all good, pleasing to the eye, good for food, everything. Okay. In fact, he says it's extra good, extraordinarily good, very good. This is even good. See, we think, oh, you look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's like a bomb ready to go off, you know, or something, or it looks creepy, and it's, you know, all this. No, it's pleasing to the eye. <laughs> Very good. It's, it's the one thing in which God puts there to say, you, every time you walk by there, you acknowledge, I'm God, you're not. You're in control of everything, but you're not in control of the universe. I have put your... And that ha helps us to even answer today this whole thing of climate change, which if you're watching the news right now and everything else, everything that's happened, you know, with Hurricane Helene and everything else, that this is all due to mankind and we're the scourge of the earth and everything else. And if we get rid of mankind, we'd all live in harmony here as apes and everything else and uh, there wouldn't be any <laughs> problems because there wouldn't be any fossil fuels or anything else. It totally doesn't understand the fall into sin. And that mankind isn't the scourge. Mankind is made in the image of God to rule. We are to have dominion. Not as people who destroy the planet, but actually to keep the planet. All right? And, 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 and to be wise stewards, to subdue it, to, to fill the earth, to take care of it, to manage it as God would manage it. And so God puts Adam here and he even says, you guys are running it. But you're acknowledging that... I'm still in God. I'm in control. You're just to be my image bearer. You're to be a spitting image of me. And to rule it is I would rule it, but I'm ruling the entire universe. All those stars, the sun, the moon. I made all that. You're not in control of all that. And so every time you walk by there and you don't do, they only have one commandment. We have ten, or six hundred and whatever, you know, in the, in the first five books of the Bible. But Adam and Eve only had one. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because there you're acknowledging that you fear, as Luther says, love, and you trust in me above all things, that I'm not holding out on you, that I've given you everything that you need, and that you're willing to just be my image bearers, but not to want to take my throne and run the whole shooting match. 
Okay. And so that's the temptation because God didn't create robots because then there can be no love. I, I went to ask uh, a young couple that. What if, I asked a guy, you know, what if you could make your wife do and think and say whatever it is you wanted to, to have her think, do and say, would you do it? He goes, boy, that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> and I go, but think about that here for a while. It would be cool for about two weeks, maybe less. And then after that, there can be no, there can be no love. You know, here's what I want you to say. I love you, Eric. You are the best. You are the most wonderful. I will do whatever you want. What is it that you want me to do? Well, then I'm just telling you, there's no love there. You have to do it. And so love opens up the opportunity for being spurned. And that's how God sets it up because he didn't create robots. Now, the sad thing is, is we are robots now. We're slaves to sin after, because it says in Genesis 5, no longer were Adam and Eve having children, and they were in the image and likeness of God. They were in their own image and likeness. And it leads to, in Genesis 5, as we see their family record, death, 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 they all die. So what now God is coming to do now is to release us from that slavery again. Thank you. So, no, it, it, but it's, it, it, is, it is the big question. Yes? You know, I joke about how the wives, you know, cause <laughs> issues. But the reality is, Abram and Adam, God spoke to them. God told them what to they do. Both and they both messed did. up their roles. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the fall actually even comes... <laughs> This is where we could get really technical from what we just read. The fall actually comes before Adam, let's, or let's, let's say it this way, before Eve eats the apple and then gives some to, to, to um, Adam, who Moses says was standing right there next to his wife. The fall's already taken place because Adam should have come up and said no and hits her, and hits her hand. So he's sitting there thinking, gee, God said eat of it, you'll surely die. Well, hmm. let's let her have a bite and see how it goes down for her. <laughs> well, she didn't die. Yeah, I guess I'll take a bite. Ah, I guess I'll try it too. But no, I mean, it shows you that he didn't trust God, and he, just like his great-great-great-great-great-grandson, Abram, threw Sarai under the bus, Eve you know, is thrown under the bus by Adam right away. And so the first fall into sin is, is Adam. He should have said no. And you can back it up even further from the word we read in Genesis 3, where don't eat of it. Adam was the one who got that um, commandment from God. And he's supposed to then teach his wife and his children. He then adds to the words of God and says, we can't eat it, but don't touch it, because he thinks, well, you know what, if I tell my wife don't touch it, then she can't eat of it. But then what, what we're doing is we're calling into question the Word of God, thinking again that we've got to help it out and add something to it, which is what we always want to do. Here's the commandment of God, and we either want to add something to it to, to protect ourselves or prevent sin, which is what a lot of times we do as Christians, or... We want to take away from it. God didn't really mean that. That was then. This is now, and things have changed. Yes, Sue? <laughs> Wasn't the first fall is when the angel thought he was so beautiful and he became Satan? That's the first. <laughs> no, that's and the that, actual fall into sin in the angelic realm, and that happens and, and, before and, Adam and Eve. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so then, then for mankind, though, but still, the earth isn't cursed with the fall in the angelic realm. No. So the earth becomes cursed then when Adam and Eve fall into sin. But that is, you know, that that is Satan again. Yeah. He was the number one top angel. Yeah, but I don't want to be the top angel. I want to be, be God. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve are the crown of God's creation, and they're in charge of everything. That's why they're naming the animals. There's a difference between animals and human beings, which helps us answer the questions today that we face. We're to be in charge of this. We're to be wise stewards of God's creation. We're put here to be the kings of this earth and queens, but I don't want to be king and queen of earth. I want to be king and queen of the whole universe. So the actual sin is, is what? Wanting to be God. Pride. That is, I tell you what, as I've been reading through the Old Testament here this year, <coughs> God really just rips on this. And you really begin to see this, the, the, the sin of pride, because that's really, it's all about 
It's all about me and what I want, which is what these, these sins are all about with Adam and Eve in the garden in here with Abram and Sarah. I want a kid. She's, she's an, I don't know how to put this. Let's just put it this way. She's an older lady. I'll just put it there. She's uh, advanced in years. Let's do that. Sarah is advanced in years. She's advanced in years, but she's acting like a spoiled little brat, brat like a two-year-old having a little temper tit. I want a child, and I want it right now. And so God should have given it to me. And Adam and Eve are doing the same thing in the garden. God said, I can't have this. But it's kind of like when a little kid, you know, you can't touch it. They're just like, uh -huh. the little kid just wants it. And so the, I give me what I want, and I want it right now. And that is, it's all about me. And it's not that God knows best. It's I know best. I know what I want, and I want it right now. Now. And that's the, that's the problem. So let's close with, I want to get through just a couple of things here so we can get through it next week. What's the problem here? Verse 1, no kids. Verse 3, 10 years have gone by. Um, what, what does Sarah think about the um, promise? Who is it for? She's beginning to wonder, well, maybe it's just for Abram, but it's not for, it's not for me. It's not for me. Maybe it's not for me. It's supposed to be that Abram, through me, is supposed to have it, but maybe, maybe it's not for me. And then she thinks God is holding out on her, just like uh, Eve thought God was holding out. And so verse 2, who did she blame again? God. The Lord has prevented me. She's, she stopped. So it's, it's me from having... So it's kind of like God is holding out, just like Satan tempted Eve. What, Jen? She was just impatient. She's very impatient. <laughs> she didn't hear so God, she didn't hear God's, God's years. kind of right. keeping she back the, the blessings... Years. And so God's keeping back the blessing, and um, oh boy, we're going to have to do something so that I can get it. But what, what's, what's, what's interesting here in this chapter when you read it, and I've, I've read it through a couple of times, and you kind of start to see some things. Look at um, these first three verses, and who does, who does um, we already know this, so there, there's got to be a reason, I don't want to give it away, but um, who does... Moses tell us that Sarai is. And so I'm, I'm just going to read, I'm just going to read this. I'm just going to read verse 1 and verse 3. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Let's go down to verse 3. So after Abram lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took care Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Who does, who does Moses remind us that Sarai is? Abram's wife. Mm -hmm. wife. 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 God says, this is going to be who, who the promise is. This was the promise to them. Abram, it's coming through Sarai. Through Sarai. Yeah. But now, Sarai says, no, it's not going to come through me. So what's the Sarai solution here is, take my servant as, look at the end of verse 3, yeah. gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Wife. Here, where we go. I'll even, I'll even be the efficient. I now pronounce you man and wife. I've solved the problem. So now I'm going to give you a different wife. And so then now, this will finally kickstart it and get it to work. And so now, maybe we should even bring in NBC, ABC, and we can have the original sister wives yes. thing going here, and we'll follow the reality show. But she was also a pagan, so she also was practicing what some of the other. People it did. was. You're exactly right. With the culture so of it, I don't have a. If I don't have a child, they I can give a servant, them, yes. and they could be the surrogate for me. Yes, that's what they. And did. so I'm just. But I, she came as a wife. Mm -hmm. and not she, a concubine or something. It, no, it's interesting in that, but that's sometimes how it would work from but a legal then, standpoint then because then it becomes than actually one. Abram's child. But yet, it's kind of going to be through me. But it's not going to. As is always the case, we think sin is going to work out, and we know better. And as we see here, things are just totally, kind of, you know, drastically fall we can apart blow it here. Up. <laughs> but um, as, as we close here today, because time has run out, we kind of see already, once again, Abram and Sarai are, are kind of disappointing people. Like you know, we are. if yeah, yeah if if, just like we are. if if they're saved by good being good people. Oh. Yeah. 
we're all done. Um, because here, as we close, to kind of close out, where I wanted to get to is to close out this Genesis uh, 3 thing with the fall with, with Adam and Eve. What should have Abram said? No. No. No, no. no I just had this, this vision, and I was a part of this covenant, and God gave me his word that if it doesn't happen, God will kill himself. You, 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 you can't do this. No, God gave me his word. God's not going to kill himself. It can't happen. Which means we've just got to wait. Can you, can you please just be patient? Just be patient. It's going to happen. God gave me his word with this covenant that if it, that if it doesn't happen, God will kill himself. But instead, verse 4 is what? He went into Hagar. Yeah. And she conceived. And when she saw she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. What does Abram do? It's the same thing, because it's the same, it's the same verbiage that uh, Sarai gave, gave, well, that's why I wanted to close with this, at the end of verse 3, gave her to Abram, her husband, just as she took some of the fruit and gave it to her husband, Adam. And he took it and ate it. And he took Hagar and went in with her and she conceived. And she saw that she, when she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress, which is now going to lead to this gigantic struggle between what's going to end up being two great nations. The Arab and the Jew. Ish Ishmael's family and Isaac's family that we're still dealing with here today, and just as a preview, what's coming up here in verse 4 and 5 will be a very interesting word choice in the Hebrew because it's a word that's found in Aramaic, it's found in Hebrew, it's found in Arabic, and you'll know it from the headlines of today, it's the word Hamas. Hamas will make its, will make its appearance here, now that's the, that's the terror group, alright, it's the Palestinian terror group. All right, it's down in Gaza. Where is Ishmael going to go? <coughs> go down there and be the father of the Arabs. Yeah. All right, so we're going to have this battle now between Ishmael and Isaac's family. And we're still seeing it today. All right, Ish but the interesting thing is that God is going to bless Ishmael. And he wanted Ishmael to have faith in him. <clears throat> From him will not come the Savior. But he wanted to make him a great nation and bless him, just as he wants to bless and save all people. But Ishmael, again, wanted to eventually do it his way. But we're going to see God have incredible mercy and grace, not only on Ishmael, but Hagar next week. Because it will be Jesus himself who will come down and comfort her. And we'll see now some amazing thing where the angel of the Lord makes now his first appearance, which is the Malak Yahweh in Hebrew, which she is going to recognize. I'm not just dealing with it. an angelic, the word there is messenger from God. I'm dealing with God himself. The same guy that Jacob will wrestle with. Yeah, but it's going to be the same thing. and It's, it's going to be this unbelievable thing that God sees her. Because is, 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 is Hagar the one that's really to blame for all this? No. 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 And so does, does, does God see our troubles? Does he sympathize with them? It, this, this world is all messed up. It's just like right now. There's a lot of innocent people that are, that are dying and there's, there's struggles. Does God sympathize with them? Yes. But this world is, is totally messed up. Jan, did you have something? I was going to say in my Bible here, it said Ishmael uh, means God hears. Yep. God, God, God hears and, and uh, he hears Hagar's pleas and cries and struggles. And, uh, and then uh, Hagar is going to say that this is a God who actually sees. So it's a God who hears and a God who sees. So that's going to be a twofold thing that we'll see next week. It's a God that, that Hagar can actually see because it'll be Jesus that she's talking to. But yet, it's not only I can see God, but it's a God, it's a two way thing. I can see God, but this God actually also sees me and knows me and knows my troubles and he actually what Care. cares cares even for ishmael's family because it's the interesting thing the first person 
that, that God comes down to comfort is not Isaac that's born first, it's actually Ishmael. And Jesus himself comes down to comfort, which I think has an amazing amount of uh, info, if you want to say, to the situation that we're with today, is that uh, does, does God care for the Palestinians? Does God care for the Iranians? That's the sad thing there too with the Iranians. There are so many people that hate the Islamic Iranian regime and want it out that live there. But they're, they're going to end up suffering for what their government is doing. And it's very sad. But, it's just, but does God actually care for these people? You better believe it. Because what does Jesus say? It's the same Jesus will talk to Hagar. God loved the world that he, that he gave me. And that's, and that's everybody. But this thing I think is amazing. I did a little word study on here. And we'll uh, get to that here next week with this Hamas thing. Which is, which is going to be kind of an amazing thing, and it's going to be um, Sarai that's going to pull out that card. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's going to be, and now that, that's been taken by so many different things. And I'll, I think I'll have some insight in, into where we're at here today. So any questions here as we close? Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to pick it up here next week. Any, any Didn't Hagar, uh, in a way, kind of went, nah, nah, boo-boo, I got pregnant, you did. Yep, sure did. And, and through her sin, and then... She was then, I don't know, what are we going to call it, like disciplined by being punished so hard. And by, by God a little bit. And, and but then, God cares. And, yeah, um, he still But it's back actually, back. you know, Sarai, which is going to be very interesting. Sarai is going to get mad than everybody else, which is what we always do. Well, yeah, I, we I, I create a gigantic problem, yeah. and it's now, and it's now, I mean, this is what's wrong with the United States it's today. Not. It's not my fault. It's I'm just a what? I'm a victim. Oh, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. Of every blessed problem that's out there, most of which you did to your, you did to yourself, and she's going to blame Abram. She's going to blame Hagar. She's going to blame God. She's going to blame, and she's the one who actually did it. She's the one that did it. But it's everybody <laughs> else's. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's everybody else's. But God takes just, our mistakes and then He turns it into. God's going to do so because He doesn't have anything else to work with. Yeah. If he's gonna, if he's gonna wait for us to be faithful and do it all right, yeah. get it all the time, then nothing's gonna get done, no. and the world will be worse off for it. It was very interesting. I was talking to somebody here from church when was it? It was last night actually, after the elders meeting, and they said, you know, the more I'm beginning to understand this, it's really a fascinating thing to me that when I look at all this stuff that happens with all this stupidity. And how things aren't worse than what they really are. It actually gives me proof that God exists. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> which is which is true. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. things should be much, much worse. Things yeah. should be much worse yeah. than what That's they are. Yeah. But but God is actually keeping it somewhat in order. In order <laughs> for His children. For us, yeah. Because yeah. if it, if there was if there was no God, we couldn't even put our kids on the school bus. Maybe it'll get that way once. It'll be so so dangerous we won't even be able to, you know, travel anywhere. But there's still what some decency and and, and order, because God is still working in the midst of all this, and we're going to see that here next week. So let's go ahead here. We've we've run out of time. Let's go ahead here and we'll close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you truly are a God who hears, as we'll see next week, and you're a God who sees and listens, and a God who cares and gives us hope. Even in the midst of our sinful, fallen, broken lives, you are there, standing there always with your gift of love, forgiveness, comfort, and more importantly, you're going to work through this entire mess to bring salvation not only for this family, but more importantly, through this family will come the salvation of the whole world. Uh, bless us, O Lord, as we continue to grow in that faith, trust, hope, and understanding. And may that pour forth in our love for one another, because that's a picture that you have in your love for us, who don't deserve it. Bless us, O Lord, and be with us, for we ask all this then in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen.